Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's the 4th of February and it's time for some more Deep Space updates. And look, I'm wearing a dressing gown. I know what you're thinking. This is not the dressing gown of doom. This is the dressing gown of being cosy and warm in winter while I'm recording stuff. We haven't had any rocket failures that I can think of in the last few weeks, which is surprising because we had a couple in the first couple of weeks of January. But yeah, let's talk about those rocket launches, starting out with the 24th of January, where Rocket Lab launched their Electron rocket from Wallops, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Regional Spaceport. Um, this was the launch was called Virginia is for rocket lovers and it carried three Hawkeye 360 satellites. So that's a first successful launch for a rocket lab from that site. I hope we see many, many more. And of course, I hope we get to see Neutron launching and recovering from that site in the future. On the 26th of January, Japan gets into the spaceflight game in 2023 with an H-2A launch from Tanegashima spaceport. Uh, this was carrying a military satellite, the IGS Information Gathering Satellite Radar 7, a synthetic aperture radar satellite in sun-synchronous orbit, which is obviously being used to you know, assess military uh, you know, threats through Asia. I think North Korea was the main thing that sort of drove Japan to develop their own independent military reconnaissance system. Um, the satellite, we don't know very much about it. It's probably about 10 tons based upon the size of the, the launch vehicle. Now, on the 26th of January, we had a Falcon 9 launching from Cape Canaveral, um, carrying 56 Starlink satellites. This is Starlink Group 52, which is in a lower 40 degree inclination orbit. Now, this is the largest number of Starlink satellites we've had recently. Remember, the early ones had 60, but as they added like the laser hardware, they cut down on the number of satellites. Now, this increase probably suggests that this is the heaviest payload ever launched by a Falcon 9, and unless there's some other one I'm forgetting. Um, and basically they're able to do this because they're launching to a slightly lower inclination, so they're going slightly faster. The 31st of January, there was another Starlink launch from Vandenberg. Uh, this was only 49 satellites into a 70 degree inclination orbit, but it also cast, uh, carried a rideshare payload. a orbits ION spacecraft, this one was called Eclectic Elena, and it carried a bunch of hosted payloads for other customers. So uh, there was a Stardust SD-1 memorial flight where they basically have a payload with a bunch of small vials containing human uh, ashes from uh, cremation so that people can fly in space after they're dead. There was a, there's a computer on board, which is a piece of avionics, which is for a future satellite mission uh, that's built by a Swiss university. Uh, there is a braking sail, which is going to you know, help deorbit the spacecraft at some point. Hey, deorbit getting deorbited by one of their payloads. How meta, huh? And finally, they're carrying a test satellite deployment system for another customer. This is like a you know, satellite deployment ring, and this customer wants to demonstrate that they can deploy satellites. So they will deploy this little uh, simulated satellite to show that this is possible. Anyway, um, moving onwards, we go to the 2nd of February and there was another Starlink group, again a 5-3 group uh, going into a 40 degree orbit, but this time they only launched 43. So I think they're trying to optimise their usage. It might be that they had three more on the previous launch and they realised that they don't actually need that many in an orbital plane. I'm not sure why they cut it back by three satellites. Or it's possible there's some secret stuff floating on board that we haven't found out to get about at this point. Uh, who knows? Anyway, um, it is also important that you, depending upon your counting things, one of these launches could be considered SpaceX's 200th Falcon 9 launch or 200th successful launch. Like, it depends how you measure things. I believe there's 202 Falcon 9 launches if you include CRS-7 and AMOS-6, which wasn't really a launch. Uh, it's 199 if you only include orbital flights of the Falcon 9, because of course one of those flights included the in-flight uh, abort demonstration of the Dragon capsule, which was glorious, but the booster never made it to orbit. So anyway... Um, Another problem company, another uh, company having problems making to orbit is uh, Virgin Orbit, who once again have taken on another $10 million loan uh, from uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Investments. And 
yeah, this is like a, a loan that can be converted into stock under the right circumstances. And the company is really in a major cash crunch situation right now. They have a few customers. It's not clear that they can launch those customers until they complete the investigation of their failure last month. Um, the Indian Space Research Organization, they announced results uh, from the failure of their small satellite launch vehicle. If you remember last year, this was a debut launch. And what happened was at stage separation, the separation shock was so large that it triggered um, it triggered like a, a, a system which thought that the accelerometers had all gone offline. So the spacecraft switched into what was called salvage mode, where it assumed the accelerometers were no good, and it then flew uh, like a close, an open loop guidance to, to orbit. And this might have made it, except that it ended up slightly off axis, slightly at the wrong angle, and about 56 meters per second slow. And there was a third stage, a velocity trimming stage, but this was disabled for the salvage mode because they, I think the idea was that they would use that when it came around a second time to trim the orbit from the ground. But because they were so slow, the satellites ended up falling into the ocean. So they have fixes in hand. They're going to launch soon. Their fixes are basically you're changing the thresholds and assuming your accelerometers are dead so that they can survive longer or so that they will have to go out for longer before they finally give up. And if they do this, they will now use navigation data from India's NAVIC system. When India has a handful of satellites that's their equivalent of GPS. So they will use that for putting spacecraft into orbit and making sure that they are getting the velocities they needed. Okay, uh, down in Boca Chica, SpaceX, Starship, Super Heavy, they were assembled and they performed a full-scaled cryo test, which took a very long time. Everything turned white and frosty. The Starship began to look a little like a giant penguin, but apparently they passed. And the official SpaceX response said that they had loaded it with over 10 million pounds of propellant. That's four and a half thousand tons, which means this is the heaviest rocket ever set up even if it didn't actually fly at that time because the Saturn V was about three and a half thousand tons. So since then they have demated the Starship, rolled it down the street and put it in the rocket garden next to you know the doomed ones so it's keeping them company before they get broken up I guess um, and we're expecting a full test. Now it was thought they might go as early as Friday but that was cancelled. Monday is the current window. This will be a full 33 engine test but it's possible that might be delayed for various reasons. This is the first time they've got to this uh, level. Also notably a new barge arrived at Boca Chica carrying a whole bunch of new ground service equipment including a new deluge system which would be really nice to have fitted before you start firing up 33 engines all at once. We'll see what happens there. Uh, also, ULA on, in Cape Canaveral, they are setting up their Vulcan rocket. They are stacking it. They are vertically integrating it. We're getting lots of cool pictures and coverage showing this thing going up in the pad. It looks like everything fits together. And I'm guessing it'll still be a few months before they go through all their checks they run all their rehearsals, demonstrate all their ground service equipment, and finally get to a launch. But, you know, this is this is looking better and better all the time. Okay, NASA announced that it is going to be working with DARPA on a nuclear rocket engine in space. Now, DARPA already had a rocket, a nuclear rocket in, like, development. It was the Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, DRACO, yes. And so the goal is that they will launch this mission by uh, tw as soon as 2027. Okay, probably be later than that, but it's not clear. They're very secret about what's actually going on. What we think we know is that this is going to be a new nuclear engine design because the reactor is not allowed to use highly enriched uranium anymore. Um, it will probably go into Earth orbit like higher than most spacecraft, 700 to 2,000 kilometers is what I hear, and then perform demonstrations there. It's not clear how long the demonstrations will be, but the longer they demonstrate it, you know, obviously the more they have to be worried about, uh, you know, fission products being radioactive in the, the core. 
putting it at a higher orbit means that it will stay in orbit a lot longer, allowing the uh, core to decay to a reasonable amount before it gets re you know, returned from space. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the European Space Agency in the last couple of weeks uh, appears to have stepped back from previous plans to send astronauts to uh, the Chinese space station. Uh, ESA head, Joseph Aschbacher, stated that um, they basically they already have their hands full with work on the International Space Station. And without the money to go elsewhere, you know, they're not really seriously focused on, on any chance of sending astronauts to China, uh, Chinese Space Station. Now, they have been working in joint exercises with China for a couple of things. For example, Samantha Cristoforetti and Matthias Maurer pr participated in like sea survival training with Chinese uh, counterparts back in uh, you know, 2017, and and a Chinese astronaut Yi Guanfu also participated in an ESA exercise. So yeah, that's that's all cool, but yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be happening anytime soon. In the U.S., Doug and Bob are now officially national heroes. Yes, it was quite a surprise, but they were awarded the Congressional Medal, Space Medal of Honor, and which is oddly named because. Congress doesn't actually have a hand in picking who gets it. So it's basically, this was created in 1969. It's like the Congressional Medal of Honor, but the president gets to pick astronauts that have, um, you know, performed above and beyond the line of duty, which is pretty high line when you consider they're astronauts. Uh, it wasn't, wouldn't actually be awarded until 1978. And then it was, you know, obviously like Neil Armstrong and Alan Shepard, uh, John Glenn, Gus Grissom got it posthumously for, you know, obviously being the first to fly Gemini and, you know, his uh, and dying in Apollo 1. Um, but yeah, since then, there's been, you know, many awards over the years. George W. Bush, he ended up giving more of these medals than any anyone else because he basically decided that the crew of a, of a Challenger and Columbia would all get the medals posthumously. Since then, neither Obama or Trump have awarded this, so it was quite a surprise to see Doug and Bob going to the White House to get these awards. They were actually awarded by Kamala Harris. And it, it is interesting that, I guess, we see that people that have flown on the first flight of a new space vehicle have all been uh, the ones to get it. Although, technically, I guess Apollo 7, they didn't get it, but it was Apollo 1 crew. I'm wondering if the first people to fly on Orion will be a shoe in for this, as well as the first people to fly on Starliner. There's actually been some discussion recently uh, about the astronaut selection process for Artemis 2, which will be the first US mission to fly around the, uh, the moon in like 50 years. Uh, it's been pointed out that Reed Wiseman removed himself from the head of the astronaut office, and that seems like a pretty big sign that he is angling to be on Artemis 2. This is a sort of a, no, nobody wants to be the head of the, art, the astronaut office because you don't get to fly in space. But there's something of a tradition that when you leave it, you get your choice of uh, what flight you want to go on. Deke Slayton famously assigned himself to the Apollo Soyuz test project after he'd been uh, unable to fly since uh, the, you know, the early days of the uh, Mercury program. So yeah, uh, okay. The Lucy mission has basically announced that they are no longer, uh, I've mentioned this, that they're no longer expanding their solar panels. They're no longer trying to finish deploying their solar panels. But, but, more interestingly, they've added a new asteroid to their schedule. And so this is an asteroid that was called 1997 VD57. Uh, I think it's going to be later this year. So basically, they saw the trajectory it was going on, and there was an astronomer, Raphael Marshall in France, who basically took the entire asteroid catalog, ran orbit solutions against that versus the trajectory of Lucy, and found that they were going to pass within uh, 64,000 kilometers of this target. So that means that they can make a small diversion to bring them on a fly past at about 60-something kilometers. So it'll be like a one meter per second burn that they have to do overall to do this. So it's a very small fraction of fuel for something that just happens to be in the right place. This will be great because it will give them a test run for like later targets, which have been, you know, higher priority, more important. So they'll have more time perhaps to debug any problems that they find. 
But again, yeah, they're no longer trying to deploy the solar panels. And I guess this is also a test that they'll be able to do the science with the panels not correctly deployed. And if they find any problems with pointing, they'll be able to address that going forwards. Okay. And if you're... <laughs> oh boy. It's not quite space, but there is that whole uh, Chinese weather balloon, spy balloon. It's it's gone from being a suspected Chinese spy balloon to be to being a China's suspected spy balloon. Yeah, this this is a balloon carrying a bunch of hardware at a well above class A airspace, and it's floated across the U.S. And look, uh, let, let's be clear: if China wants to spy on the U.S., there's many many other ways that it has to do this. It has almost as many spy satellites as the U.S., and they're definitely getting close in terms of capabilities. Um, like, and of course, U.S. airspace is a lot more open than than China's. Uh, I, I mean, I I'm pretty sure that uh, this is this is it, it's unfortunate case of the balloon not deflating and returning to Earth. Uh, and it's interesting that the U.S. has decided that it best not to shoot it down. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, like, it, it's possible, like, I think, first of all, it would confirm that there were capabilities if it happened again. Um, it could potentially make an incident worse. But honestly, yeah, there's not much to be gained that isn't already known. Now, it's not like the 1950s, where the US was flying spy balloons over uh, the Soviet Union so they could, you know, look at their missile sites. This is uh, something I talked about in a previous video, and if you haven't watched it, you should go and watch it because there's a really cool story in there about the fact that General Mills, the maker of breakfast cereals, was heavily involved in this. And the Soviet Union ended up doing something very cool with one of the recovered pieces of hardware. Yeah, go and watch that video. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. And one final little item, which uh, matters a bit to me as a, well, given my day job, uh, the, I, the space station has a whole set of new iPads. I've noticed looking at the photos coming out of the International Space Station, the astronauts now have uh, iPad Pros with their M1 processors, which is a big step up from their previous iPad Airs. Oh yeah. The iPads are like a big part of space station operations. It's not like they just use them for watching movies. That's how they started out. But uh, I, there's a photo I like which shows an astronaut reading instructions off an iPad, listening to music on a second iPad, and using the camera on a third iPad to document a, an experiment. So these things are becoming like a major part of station life. So they also have the pencil, which is the stylus that lets them write. So it makes it a lot more like, you know, the pads from Star Trek The Next Generation, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this is just, it's always cool to see com consumer hardware in space. And I did point out that back in November, when CRS-26 launched, the patch did include some mysterious cryptic uh, icons, and I thought there might be an Apple on there. And yeah, I think that's the mission that took those up. Now, since uh, you guys are all like, oh, he's an Apple fanboy, what is he? like, this, I'm going to say, is the last Deep Space update that I am going to record and make on my current PC because I got a new PC that I built last night and it is it is going to provide all the CPU power I need because well Kerbal Space Program 2 is coming and honestly I have a very old seven year old computer I don't really need a brand new computer to run <laughs> run this but I figured it was a perfect excuse to finally get my thing updated. So yes, uh, that's the, the news for this week. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with more stuff. Hopefully it won't be quite as cold. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.